and welcome to the review of the Costanzo Physiology textbook, this time going over the next portion of the gastrointestinal physiology chapter, covering digestion and absorption. This chapter is relatively large, but we'll try to go through and summarize all of the major points that are best to know in this portion of this chapter. If you do enjoy the video, please don't forget to give it a like and subscribe to the channel. And if you want downloadable audio files of each of these chapters or just support the channel, you can do so in the Patreon link within the description. So starting off with some definitions, digestion is just the chemical breakdown of our ingested foods so then they can become absorbable. And then absorption is just the movement of these nutrients, water, and electrolytes from the lumen of the intestine into our bloodstream. And that can occur through two paths, either the cellular path, meaning it goes through the cells, usually needing a protein transport mechanism, or paracellular pathway, which means going through the tight junctions. And the movement through the paracellular pathway just depends on how tight those tight junctions are. Now a key concept with our intestines is that although the intestines is just a tube, it's able to dramatically increase the surface area for absorption through several mechanisms here. The first is that our surface of our small intestine is actually arranged in these longitudinal folds. And these folds are called the folds of Kirkering. But not only is the surface of the intestine folded on itself, we also have these finger-like projections called villi from these folds. And then on these villi are the epithelial cells, and on the epithelial cells themselves are microvilli, these tiny, tiny little projections from the cells themselves. So the folds, the villi, and the microvilli can increase the total surface area of the small intestine by 600 fold, giving it as much surface as possible to absorb those nutrients that have been digested. One little point here is that this epithelial cells within the intestine do have an extremely high turnover rate of any cells in the body. They're replaced every three to six days. So they are very sensitive to anything which is damaging to highly reproducible cells. So for instance, chemotherapy, which kills off highly dividing cells, which is meant to take out your cancer, can take out your epithelial cells and is why you can get severe GI side effects with chemotherapies. Now getting it into how each nutrient is digested and absorbed, table 8.6 here is essentially just a very rough summary of the entire portion of digestion and absorption. It goes through every single nutrient which products can be absorbed, where they get absorbed, and how they get absorbed. It doesn't tell you anything about the enzymes that digest them, but otherwise this is a pretty nice overview if you just want one cheap little table that's able to give you the majority of the information that you need. But we'll go through each component separately. So starting off with carbohydrates, these need to be broken down into their smallest subunit, which is a monosaccharide. And those subunits include three different monosaccharides, glucose, galactose, and fructose. So we have to break it down into those tiny, tiny subunits. The intestine is not able to absorb even disaccharides, which is just two of the subunits attached together, like sucrose or lactose. So digestion of carbohydrates has to be complete all the way down to the monosaccharide form. Now, the most complex of our carbohydrates is starch, which contains a lot of these monosaccharides. So starch gets broken down by alpha amylase, starting off in your saliva and then finished off in your pancreatic juices in your small intestine, breaking it down into alpha for dextrins, maltose, and then maltotrios. And then as all these other disaccharides enter our small intestine, these guys go up to the brush border of the small intestine, which is essentially all the microvilli of the epithelial cells. Right at that brush border, we have all these other enzymes to break down these disaccharides into monosaccharides. So alpha dextrinase, maltase, and sucrase to break down those breakdown products of starch into glucose. Trilohase, which breaks down trilolose into glucose, lactase to break down lactose into glucose and galactose. Remember, lactose comes from milk, and this is a part of lactose intolerance, is if you don't have lactase, then you can't break down lactose into glucose and galactose. So then you have a lot of lactose just sitting in your small intestine that cannot be absorbed, and it's highly osmotically active, so it actually holds onto water and promotes diarrhea. So that is one of the disorders of carbohydrate digestion and absorption. The last disaccharide here is sucrose, 
which gets broken down with sucrase into glucose and fructose. Once we have those three monosaccharides ready to be absorbed, glucose and galactose use the SGLT1 glucose transporter, which uses the sodium electrochemical gradients to transport into the cell. So that's driven by the sodium potassium ATPase pump on the basolateral surface. Remember this pump creates a driving force for sodium to be absorbed, which brings with it glucose and galactose via the secondary active transport mechanism using SGLT1. And then we have fructose, which actually passively diffuses into the cell via facilitated diffusion using the GLUT5 transporter. Once within the cell, these molecules are then able to be absorbed into the blood via the GLUT2 transporter using facilitated diffusion. So glucose and galactose can get absorbed against their concentration gradient initially using sodium as that secondary active transporter, whereas fructose is dependent on a passive concentration gradient using facilitated diffusion. So that is carbohydrates, their digestion and absorption. Next is our proteins, which starts in the stomach using pepsin that has to be activated by a low pH, getting divided from pepsinogen into pepsin. And then it's completed by our pancreatic enzymes, which includes endopeptidizers, pepsin, trypsin, chymotrypsin, and elastase to further break down those proteins. And then it's ended by some exopeptidizers, mainly on the brush border, which hydrolyzes one amino acid at a time. So a, a way to think about the difference between endopeptidizers and exopeptidizers is that endopeptidizers break down proteins, like if a protein is a pretzel, you're breaking down that pretzel. And then the exopeptidizers is essentially taking off the salt molecules off the pretzel, which is an individual amino acid. So endopeptidases just break the entire structure, exo just takes it away one amino acid at a time. An example of exopeptidases is carboxypeptidase A and B. So we talked about pepsin getting activated in the stomach from low pH. Once the proteins enter the small intestine, their further breakdown all depends on the activation of trypsinogen into trypsin using the enzyme on the brush border called enterokinase. And this is so important because trypsin then actually activates all of our other proteases, including itself. So it activates every single other protease in the pancreatic juice, which can then break down the proteins into smaller molecules. So if we do not have the ability to break down trypsinogen into trypsin, then we end up having maldigestion of proteins, which can happen with pancreatitis if we don't release enough trypsin to activate all of our other proteases in the small intestine. Now, the difference between protein absorption and carbohydrate absorption is that proteins can be reabsorbed if they're dipeptides or tripeptides, in addition to obviously the smallest subunit, which is the amino acid, whereas carbohydrates had to be broken all the way down to monoglycerides. So once the proteins are broken down into the smaller subunits, they also use a sodium amino acid code transporter to be transported into the bloodstream. So it also uses secondary active transport and facilitated transport to get into the bloodstream and be absorbed. As you can see over here in figure 8.3 here, we create that sodium gradient using the sodium ATPase pump. Then we use that sodium gradient to bring in amino acids, which then get absorbed via facilitated diffusion. Dipeptides and tripeptides have to be transported in with an acid, which is utilized using a sodium hydrogen exchanger. So sodium comes in, hydrogen ions go out, which isn't drawn here. So sodium going in and then hydrogen ions going out, and then the hydrogen can then be used to absorb our dipeptides. So hydrogen absorbs our dipeptides, tripeptides, sodium absorbs our amino acids via secondary active transport, and then they can be reabsorbed using facilitated diffusion from there. Next is our lipids. Now lipids are our triglycerides, which is made out of glycerol and fatty acids. Cholesterol, which usually is this cholesterol esters, which means cholesterol and a fatty acid, and our phospholipids, which is lysolithocin and fatty acids. So our lipids are a little bit more complicated because they are not soluble in an aqueous solution, which is what our chyme is. Our gastrointestinal tract is just filled with aqueous fluid. So our lipids are not soluble within that fluid and cannot be digested that easily by lipases. 
So there's a couple things that occurs. First, in the stomach, the stomach kind of churns the lipids into smaller droplets to increase the surface area for those enzymes to be able to actually get to the lipids. And they get separated by dietary proteins and also some lingual and gastric lipases that start the digestion. But the main way that the lipids get broken up is in the small intestine by bile salts, which we've already talked about in the secretion portion of this chapter. Remember, bile salts get created in the liver, stored in the gallbladder, and then secreted by CCK stimulus as fatty acids into the duodenum. So then the bile salts can then emulsify the small droplets of the lipids, making them now soluble in the aqueous solution and increasing the surface area for our pancreatic lipases to get in and actually break down these triglycerides into their constitutes and also the breakdown of cholesterol esters by cholesterol ester hydrolase into cholesterol and fatty acids and phospholipids as well by phospholipase A2. So these pancreatic enzymes can then start to actually break down the lipids as they are emulsified by bile salts. Now these final products are still hydrophobic so they need to be stabilized in this form called missiles, M-I-C-E-L-L-E-S. And this is using those bile salts again to create a hydrophilic outer and hydrophobic inner to kind of store those hydrophobic lipid products. And then these missiles then can then go to our brush border and then almost just open up and give out the lipid products to the enterocyte cell. Once those lipid products enter the cell, the bile salts then detach and actually float down the small intestine to get absorbed in the terminal ileum. And then these lipid products actually get reconverted into the original lipids that they came from. So cholesterol combines with fatty acids again to form an ester, monoglyceride fuse with our fatty acids to form triglycerides, and then we also form our phospholipids as well. And then these get processed in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, combining with apoproteins to form something called a chylomicron which is similar to our missile before, but this is just another way to keep our lipids in one package, which is called a chylomicron, to then get absorbed by getting exocytosed out of the enterocyte. And importantly, this does not go into the blood, it goes into the lymphatic system via the lacteals, which then eventually dumps into the systemic circulation via this thoracic duct. So there's a lot more steps in our lipid digestion and absorption going from pancreatic enzyme secretion, bioacid secretion, emulsification, missile formation, diffusion of these lipid byproducts into the intestinal epithelial cells, chylomicron formation, and then transfer of these chylomicrons into the lymph. So any issue in this pathway then results in poor lipid reabsorption, which could include pancreatic insufficiency, so not enough lipases. It could include acidity of the duodenal contents, which means that, that the pancreatic enzymes are inactivated. We may have a deficiency in our bile salt due to poor absorption in our ilia, maybe due to an ileal resection. Bacterial overgrowth also conjugates our bile salts, so then they actually get absorbed too early and cannot function to actually emulsify our lipids and help to reabsorb our lipid products. If our surface area of our intestinal cells is reduced, so we have destruction of our intestinal cells, then we will not have as much lipid absorption. And then finally, we may have a failure to actually synthesize apoproteins and form those chylomicrons to then transport our lipids into our lymphatic system. So lipid digestion and absorption is a little bit more complicated and just involves a couple extra steps, including bile to then emulsify the fats. We then have to kind of reconfigure the lipids in the enterocyte, and then they get absorbed into the lacteals in the lymphatic system. So next we're going to talk about vitamins, which are only required in small amounts, but they are very essential as coenzymes and cofactors for various metabolic reactions within our body. And they are not synthesized within our body, so we have to have a dietary intake of them. There's two types. We have fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K, which are processed just like our dietary lipids. They are incorporated into missiles and then into chylomicrons within the enterocytes and then get absorbed that way. 
And then our water-soluble vitamins, B1, B2, B6, B12, C, biotin, folic acid, nicotinic acid, pantothenic acid, etc. These get absorbed like our other nutrients via the sodium co-transport mechanism. Now the exception here is vitamin B12 that we've brought up a couple times throughout these videos because vitamin B12 or cobalamin requires intrinsic factor to actually get absorbed and there's a couple more steps in the absorption of this vitamin. First it has to be released from the food by the digestive action of pepsin within the stomach. Then the free vitamin B12 binds to something called R proteins from our salivary juices. Once in the duodenum, the pancreatic proteases actually break off this R protein and then B12 can finally be transferred to our intrinsic factor which kind of stabilizes it and making it resistant to any degradative actions of other pancreatic proteases until it gets to the ileum where it can now be absorbed. Without vitamin B12 we get something called pernicious anemia because B12 is required for the maturation of our red blood cells. Now moving on to some trace minerals, we have calcium which the absorption of calcium depends on the active form of vitamin D, which is 1,25-dihydroxycholecalciferol. This gets activated by the kidneys from 25-hydroxycholecalciferol, which actually comes from the liver, which created this molecule from cholecalciferol, which actually came from our diet. So diet to liver to kidney until we have activated vitamin D. We will cover this in more details in chapter 9 in our endocrinology chapter, but as we've also talked about before, deficiency of calcium absorption in children causes rickets and in adults causes osteomalacia. And then last but not least is iron gets absorbed in the free iron states so are iron 2 plus or as heme iron. If it gets absorbed as heme iron, then it gets digested into free iron anyway, which then binds to apoferritin to be transported into the blood. Once in the blood, it binds to beta globulins in the blood and is called transferrin, which then gets stored within the liver until it's needed by the bone marrow to create red blood cells. So that is our nutrients and how they get absorbed. We're gonna finish off this video talking about how our fluid and electrolytes get absorbed. Starting off with the figure 833 here, which shows us how much liters of fluid that we actually absorb through our intestines every day, which is quite a significant amount, about nine liters, majority of which is coming from the small intestine, which is absorbing the water that we drink, but more importantly, all those juices that we create to digest and absorb our nutrients. So saliva, gastric juice, pancreatic juice, and our small intestine fluid all needs to be reabsorbed or else we actually lose a lot more fluid than what we take in. So as you can see, diet only constitutes two liters of that nine liters that we actually reabsorb. The majority of which, as I mentioned, gets absorbed in the small intestine, isoosmotically with you know, absorbing sodium chloride, etc. But the colon is the last portion of our alimentary tract, which absorbs the rest of our water and electrolytes. There is a small amount, about 200 liters from those nine liters, which actually gets excreted in our feces. So starting at our intestinal absorption, we talked about how it's an isoosmotic reabsorption of water, similar to our renal proximal tubule, so in our duodenum we are absorbing a lot of sodium, so then water just follows passively with it since we're absorbing a lot of sodium with a lot of nutrients. So sodium absorption brings with it some water in a one-to-one -one fashion. As you can see in this top figure showing us a duodenal cell, we do have sodium absorption with our sugars or amino acids, but we also have sodium being absorbed exchanging for a hydrogen ion that comes from our carbonic and hydrase equation within the cell. The bicarbonate transporter is on the basolateral surface, so we actually have one bicarbonate being reabsorbed with sodium. In our duodenum, we have a net absorption of water and sodium bicarbonate, whereas in our ileum, it's slightly different because we actually have a bicarbonate chloride co-transporter on our luminal surface. So that bicarbonate gets formed by the carbonic anhydrase equation actually goes into the ileum and we have a chloride transporter on the basolateral surface. So in the ileum, it's still isoosmotic reabsorption, but we actually absorb sodium chloride with the water instead of sodium bicarbonate up in the duodenum. In the colon, this is very similar to the principal cells within the kidney. 
So we have our sodium ATPase pump on the basolateral surface, but we have these sodium channels to reabsorb sodium and the potassium channels to secrete potassium. So aldosterone actually has a similar effect in our colon here to increase the reabsorption of sodium, which subsequently increases the secretion of potassium. So you can almost think of these colon epithelial cells as our principal cells in our kidney. And it even has this flow rate dependent nature to it. So if you increase the intestinal flow, then you actually increase the secretion of potassium as you reduce the potassium concentration in the lumen and increase that gradient for potassium to be secreted. So diarrhea results in quite a lot of potassium loss within our species and subsequent hypokalemia within our blood. Now we do also have secretion of fluid from our intestines as well. Although they are reabsorbing a lot, there is a secretion component of it shown in this figure 836 here. So we do have the sodium potassium chloride pump on the basolateral surface which means that chloride is going to be secreted into the lumen, which sodium then follows. So we actually get some salt secretion, which results in water being secreted as well. Now, chloride channels here can be upregulated via some hormones and neurotransmitters like VIP. So then we get increased secretion of chloride and the increased movement of sodium and water out into the lumen, so increased secretion of the intestinal fluid. And this can actually be pathologically upregulated due to some bacteria like cholera and also E. coli. They come into the cell and their toxin actually upregulates the production of our chloride channels by basically turning on the switch and making cyclic AMP being produced. So then our chloride channels get highly produced. We get increased chloride secretion, increased sodium and water secretion, and something called a secretory diarrhea. Because we actually have multiple types of diarrhea, and secretory diarrhea is one of the main ones for bacterial infection, and that causes a very substantial diarrhea because we are not only losing Using the water that normally is found in the small intestine and within our gastrointestinal system, we are actually increasing the production of the fluid to be lost. You know, we are secreting more fluid to be lost. The two other types of diarrhea includes decreased surface area, so that's infection, inflammation, breaking down our villi, so then we actually result in less absorption. So then our nutrients and water just doesn't get absorbed, so then we end up with diarrhea. And then osmotic diarrhea, which we talked about with lactose intolerance, where you have a deficiency in some kind of enzyme which needs to break down a nutrient. And then the example is lactase deficiency resulting in lactose being present in the small intestine, which holds onto water and causes an osmotic diarrhea. So those are our three types of diarrhea, decreased surface area, osmotic and secretory. So that will be the end of this video for today. We'll finish off this chapter with one more video talking about liver physiology, including a summary of the chapter and some summary questions. Feel free to drop a comment, otherwise we'll see you in the next one.